Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining the HLB International Tax Webinar covering guilty and a little bit of FDII this morning. We're just going to wait another minute or two here prior to getting started to ensure everyone is able to join. Okay, looking like we are five past the hour here. We'll go ahead and get started. I think people may or may not be trickling is. Sometimes uh, we know GoToMeeting can be a little a little touchy to get into, but uh, hopefully everyone will be able to join uh, as we go forward here. So again, thanks for thanks for coming out to uh, the tax webinar covering uh, guilty and FDII. The format we've chosen here is to try and do a kind of a, a virtual panel where three industry uh, industry practitioners are going to talk about, you know, guilty, sort of the mechanics of guilty and what it looks like and how it applies and, and FDII to a, to a lesser extent. Um, and, and just some of the issues that we're seeing uh, around guilty and, and how it's going to uh, impact taxpayers. I'm sure at this point, a lot of you on the call have had some, some touch points with guilty or FDII, and uh, maybe some of this will be a review for you, but hopefully um, we, can, we can provide uh, a good session here. So, Advancing our slides. Let's see. So on uh, on today's presentation, uh, we're supposed to have Kimberly Fallon, but she she was unable to join this morning, having some technical difficulties. We do have Haya Siegfried. She's a senior manager and the lead international business tax for Witham Smith and Brown. Um, we have myself, Christopher Stroh, the international tax manager at Id Bailey, and Yan Yang. He's a senior manager at Green Hassan and Jenks. So without further ado, uh, we'll get started. So really, um, the first place I'd like to start here is just a, just a very broad overview on what is, what is guilty. And, and that's kind of funny. I've actually had this question come across my desk before where, uh, where, where we look at the acronym of guilty and what it stands for, which is global and tangible low taxed income. And it's a, it, it's, it's a strange little misnomer. I don't know if Yan or, or Haya, you would you would agree that it's uh, that it's not probably a, an appropriately named uh, uh, section, but it, it is kind of it's kind of funny that they do offer it. Uh, uh, it suggests that it only applies to low taxed income, when that really, as you'll see, isn't necessarily the case. Um, we uh -huh. do see that guilty really acts as a way to um, kind of, in some senses, end deferral for for. In a, in a strange way. So it, it taxes uh, earnings of a controlled foreign corporation, which as we can see has not otherwise been subject to US tax um, on, a, on a current basis. Um, effectively guilty is uh, what they call tested income. So there's some new terms that are thrown out uh, with guilty. Tested income less whatever this deemed tangible income return is. And, and as I mentioned, this, this guilty uh, has caught a couple of people in the trap saying, well, if I'm in a jurisdiction that has, uh, you know, a higher tax than I would otherwise be subject to here in the U.S., then this is not going to apply to me, and that's that's unfortunately not the case here. Guilty guilty seems to apply to almost all taxpayers uh, with with controlled foreign corporations, or certainly U.S. shareholders of controlled foreign corporations. That's something um, yeah. uh, we'll see going forward. Hi, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, was, I was just going to say I heard it best described as a. Um, a full inclusion system masquerading as a territorial system, which basically <laughs> means so historically where we were able to defer income in, earned in CFCs, we're, we're now pretty much in a full inclusion regime. There is some tax, foreign tax credit function available, which could reduce your tax on your full inclusion. But for the most part, that that's pretty much what we're dealing with. So I would have to agree that the, the, the term guilty or global and tangible low tax income is is not act, does not accurately represent uh, what we are dealing with 
it, it, it's so funny that they went to all the trouble to, to present this territorial system that we're trying to move towards and then threw in guilty, which uh, undermined the entire thing effectively. Yeah, and there's the other, the other day I just joked with uh, Chris about this name. So we only agree two words of this name, which is global income. So there's no, no sense of intangible low tax. So. <laughs> Anyway, a, a, an interesting development in the world of tax reform. So, as I mentioned, who who is subject to guilty is kind of kind of a question I want to bring up. And this there's a there's a little bit of nuance in this change of law and who this will apply to as well. Um, as you can see, it applies to U.S. shareholders of controlled foreign corporations. So, classically, um, we know what a controlled foreign corporation is. That's where U.S. shareholders own more than 50% of the vote or value of a foreign corporation. We also know, uh, have previously known what a U.S. shareholder is, and this is where things get a little more nuanced, in that the definition of a U.S. shareholder has been broadened slightly, or maybe not slightly, perhaps massively, depending on how, on how your ownership structure works. A U.S. shareholder used to be just a U.S. person who owned 10% uh, or more of the vote of a corporation, and that has been expanded to vote or value. So that has kind of thrown a lot of uh, shareholders into the into the basket of owning a controlled foreign corporation where they where they might not necessarily by definition have owned a controlled foreign corporation before. And since they are in fact U.S. shareholders of that controlled foreign corporation, they will be subject to guilty here. Um, we do know that U.S. persons are individuals, corporations, partnerships, LLCs. So this applies. Uh, this rule applies very broadly. Um, very similar to how subpart F income would apply, but we should note that there are, you know, this this is not subpart F income, and we'll talk about some of those differences here in a second. Um, I, I, um, I I know people are going to get caught in this trap of becoming a U.S. shareholder. Certainly, people have invested in certain, you know, investment partnerships or investment investment vehicles where they only had they only had a 10% value ownership. In it previously not subjecting subject them to the COC rules, but um, certainly, uh, certainly a surprise and a broadening of, of who is a U.S. shareholder came in here that, that, will, that will effectively apply to a lot more people. Yeah, Chris, I think it's that, and then there's also the, it's, so it's the change in the definition where it's expanded to vote and value, um, but then there's also the repeal of 958B4, which now allows for attribution, from, downward attribution from foreign entities. And so that's another rule, which, and that's definitely beyond the scope of this discussion, but it, it also um, further expanded the definition of who is a, share, a U.S. shareholder in a CFC to the point where it's now really incumbent upon us um, that any time we're dealing with the U.S individual or U.S. taxpayer that owns shares in a foreign entity, we now have to do that CFC analysis to determine whether it's not a CFC in light of the new definitions, you know, the vote and value, the repeal of 958B4, and then of course there's the 30-day rule that was changed as well. So um, with the with the new guilty, there's also all these rules and in, in the changes, and there, there are significant changes in the definition of what's a CFC and who's a shareholder in a CFC. Right. Thanks, Haya. So, you know, as I mentioned, this is, and as you're probably all feeling if you have familiarity with this subject, this is starting to look a little bit like uh, subpart F income, classically subpart F, which didn't didn't broadly change outside some of the things that uh, Haya was just mentioning there with the expansion of the definitions. Um, Yen, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about some of the differences between traditional subpart F and guilty. Sure. Thank you, Chris. So what's the difference between guilty and traditional subpart F income? So I know we talk about subpart F income, but just in case this is the first time you heard about subpart F income. So in this international tax world, Subpart F income is typically a bad income for U.S. shareholders. Um, if a U.S. shareholder owns a CFC, which is controlled foreign corporation, and a certain transaction that CFC may recognize Subpart F income to U.S. shareholders, uh, we say this is bad income because 
one thing is uh, this SARPA F income is mandatory inclusion by the U.S. shareholder, regardless the CFC make actual distribution. So which means even the foreign corporation, the CFC doesn't make actual cash distribution to U.S. shareholder. The U.S. shareholder still need to recognize this income. So this is one reason we call it bad. The other reason we call it bad income because if the U.S. shareholder is the individual, the tax rate on this subpar F income is at ordinary rate. So individual ordinary rate is 37% because normally in real practice, we try to make our individual shareholder, if they have to recognize income, we'll try to make it as um, qualified dividend rates, which is 20%. So this surprise income is bad. It's, it's very hard to change it, the character or change the tax rate. So guilty is not subpar F income. There are so many difference. We say it different, it doesn't mean subpar F income is bad, guilty is good. They, we will say they're both bad, but it depends on which one is worse. So in certain circumstances, one may, guilty may be better, but some circumstances, uh, SARPA F income may be better. So we'll talk about this later. And the calculation of guilty is after SARPA F income. So if you have CFC and the CFC both ha have both SARPA F income and guilty, and you calculate SARPA F income first, and then the, because the SARPA F income is excluded from guilty calculation. Also, SARPA F income have many exceptions. One of the exception is called high tax exception, which uh, which means if a U.S. person own a foreign CFC, and then the CFC recognize subpar F income, and also if that CFC operated in a foreign country, that foreign country have a higher tax rate, and the tax rate is higher than ninety percent of U.S. corporate rate, which is twenty one percent times. 90% give us 18.9%. Uh, if the CFC is subject to this higher tax, and then the U.S. shareholder can elect not include this super F income as a U.S. tax. So this is exemption for super F income. However, for guilty purpose, there's no such exception. And another difference about guilty is the dividend received from related party should exclude it from guilty calculation. But for SAPRA F income, sometimes they may be included in SAPRA F income calculation. But again, there's uh, some nuance about exception play around with the guilty uh, for the SAPRA F income calculation. Also, SAPRA F income have certain limitation. It's limited to current year ENP, which means if a CFC, the current year is a loss, a huge loss, and most likely, even their certain transaction will generate SAPRA F income, but that CFC, because have laws, it shouldn't have SAPRA F income for that year. But for guilty purpose, there's no such concept of current limitation of current year ENP. The reason is SAPRA F income calculation is entity by entity, while for guilty purpose, the calculation is at an aggregate basis which means each, if a U.S. shareholder owns multiple CFCs, each CFC, we need to calculate tested income and deem the return, and then aggregate all those items at shareholder level, and then we calculate one number that is guilty inclusion. So those are some differences between guilty and super F income. Chris? Thanks, Ian. Maybe, um, maybe, Ian, you can give us a little bit of background on on one of the concepts that's introduced in guilty, the tested tested income, and kind of what that is. Sure. So, for the calculation of guilty, as we just said, it's at aggregate basis. So that's why we have concept called tested income. And the calculation of guilty is very formula driven. And with limited time at this seminar, we will just give you some basic idea. So each CFC 
will calculate their test income is calculate start from the gross income of the CFC and then subtract allocable expenses for that CFC and then you get net just for high level estimate if you are doing year end projection either you have client have this situation or you are CFO of the company you can think about you just take the net income of the foreign company for the moment that if their net income is huge that probably give you an idea this company may be subject to guilty calculation but Certain gross income are not included in guilty calculation. For example, ECI, which is effectively connected income. If a CFC conduct U.S. trader business, that income may already be subject to U.S. tax. So for guilty calculation, we should exclude it. Also, as we said, super F income should not be included in guilty calculation and super F income, which was ex excluded because of high tech exception, this item should also be excluded. And dividend received from related parties should not be included. And also, if the CFC is doing oil, foreign oil and gas extract income, that income should also be excluded for passing income purpose. Thank you, please. Well, thanks, Yan. One of the points, one of the points I wanted to drive home uh, on this slide, and maybe harp on for just a minute, is the is the use of the subpart F income uh, that's been excluded by high tax exception. So, so that amount would not ordinarily will not be included in the guilty calculation. This is kind of a, a tricky one, and when the law first came out, it it, it tripped me up just a minute because I, I was thinking the high tax, you know, anything. Anything under a high tax exception would be uh, would be excluded from guilty. Thereby, if you were in a high tax jurisdiction, um, a lot of a lot of your um, a lot of the income would not be subject to guilty. Well, that's 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 that was my misreading of it when it first came out initially. Really, this exception is is very limited. So, if you have income in this CFC which would otherwise be subpart F income and then is not subpart F income by reason of the high tax exception, only those amounts uh, of income could, could be excluded from this guilty calculation. So it's, it, it, it's, it's a very nuanced and subtle point that is, not, that is not well described or written in the rules, but I just wanted to highlight that as, as I've come across this in practice, people, people curious if, if this is a way to exclude certain income uh, for, from guilty being that it's subject to high tax already. Chris, I'm going to jump in here just and also say, you know, with the um, with the proposed regs that we got on the guilty, so the 951A regs, um, the guidance that we've gotten indicates that when we're looking at a CFC and we're determining what the CFC tested income is, we have to treat the CFC as a domestic corporation and do like a, a taxable income calculation or you know us practitioners and we're familiar with what we refer to as book tax adjustments to come up with taxable income so what's interesting is you know historically subpart f has been based on like an emp concept and this um guilty tested income is not an emp concept it is a taxable income concept similar to Again, if we were dealing with a domestic corporation, so uh, things that may not apply to an EMP discussion or a subpart F discussion, things such as like a 163J interest expense limitation is relevant for guilty purposes. So any expenses or deductions that are limited, if they would, that would be limited if they were incurred by a domestic corporation are likewise limited uh, in determining what your tested income is. So it's, it's, it's going to be an interesting exercise going through our, our guilty calculations first time around and, and working through this. It's almost as if we're doing a, a U.S. tax return for each and every one of our CFCs. That's, that's a good point. That'll, that, and that'll really expand the, the, uh, the time and effort that's put into to CFC and and this and this concept of tested income um, going forward. I know I know ENP has been uh, it's been a bit more nebulous concept, but under that under that theory, Kaya, that would um, that would really um, <laughs> create quite a bit more work potentially. Well, that's absolutely, and what gets confusing yeah. is you know we're 
we are jumping back. We're kind of toggling back and forth between EMP and taxable income because for mm -hmm. tested, tested income and loss purposes, we're in a taxable income concept, but then we're still tracking our attributes like our EMP and our PTI. So it's, it's, there's going to be a lot of confusion and, and, you know, prepare to, prepare to have to roll up your sleeves and, and, uh, you know, dig into to the calculations because they're not going to be the high level. I mean, I think subpart F is, has been more high level historically. It hasn't been as much of an effort to calculate your subpart F and this is going to take it to a whole new level. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's a, I think that's a really good point, and I think even with this proposed regs that have come out in the package, the guidance they provided, we can still see that there's some some quest, open questions out there, and I'm not sure to what extent things things will be will get firmed up. I did read something the other day where they are expected uh, a reg package to 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 be like I would say updated or something along those lines, but I'm just not exactly sure what other guidance will. We'll get, and as you mentioned, it'll it'll be interesting to see the fallout and how things progress, and how certainly the IRS will look at things and handle things. So, um, the uh, the the world of uncertainty continues. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of the uh, part of the, the the computation which we introduced sort of at the very beginning, where guilty equals this uh, this tested income less this deemed tangible income return. Uh, Haya, can you give us a little background on what, what this deemed tangible income return is? Sure. So, you know, the whole guilty, um, the legislative history, the policy behind this, a lot of it comes out of this idea that uh, U.S. taxpayers were migrating their IP offshore. So they're migrating their intangible assets offshore. And in doing so, they managed to migrate the income associated with those tangible assets offshore. And so the guilty is the global intangible. Um, you know, the, the intent was, while it's, it, it definitely is far more broad than that, but the intent was to pull back in the intangible income. Now, the reason why people were migrating intangible assets is for two reasons. Firstly, they're intangible, so it's easy to take them around. And also, the intangible assets are the assets that really generate the high, the high yield. So when, when doing this guilty calculation, as was mentioned earlier, it's not that we're tracing income to specific assets. So we're not looking to trace you know, where the income is coming from and when it's coming from intangible assets. Rather, it's a formulaic approach. And, and what the formula does is basically it, 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 it uses the process of elimination because it's easier to identify our tangible assets. The approach basically tells us that we're allowed a 10% return on our tangible assets and everything in a, on top of that return, which is our deemed tangible income return, is going to be your deemed intangible income or your global intangible income. So the rate, the, the tangible, assets that we're looking at are any assets that are depreciable under section 167 that are used in a trader business so think machinery and equipment just the standard assets that we would depreciate um, we're looking at their net tax value so it's after depreciation the value after depreciation and the allowed return is 10 percent. so these assets are referred to as the qualified business asset investment so that's a new terminology coming out of guilty and fitty is this Q buy. So you're allowed a return of 10% on your Q buy, and that's going to be your deemed tangible income return. Uh, and uh, everything, again, everything over and above your Q buy, everything over and above your deemed tangible return is going to be your global intangible income. So if that doesn't make it any more uh, any more difficult, you've got to really spend. Uh, it sounds like some some real time on figuring out what the depreciation really is on these uh, on these qualified business assets that that, that are in your CFC. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but 
you know the concept the the, the concept of tested income uses effectively uh, creating what would what would be U.S. taxable income for for lack of a better word of of what the CFC would have been under 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 subpart F and E and P concepts we depreciate all these assets under ADS on a straight line basis. Is that does that carry over here? Hi. Yeah, I believe it does. Yeah. So then, so we'll be we'll be doing all sorts of depreciation calculations separately as well. Yes. And and we I mean based on the guidance and the regs we have to go back to the beginning of time with our assets even though we're just looking at say a 2018 uh, guilty calculation if you have assets on the books for 5 years you have to go back and depreciate them and figure out how they would have been depreciated over the last five years in accordance with the U.S. tax principles. So definitely the first year, I mean, Chris, you had mentioned earlier, and I think we should reiterate, there is going to be a lot more work around CFCs with the guilty calculation. Um, we haven't even discussed the foreign tax credit component, but that's another piece that's just going to add a significant amount of time and complexity to calculations and taxable income relative to CFCs. Right. Well, good to have it on our radar anyway, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, so it's not all, it's not all, I, I would say, absolute gloom and doom for everybody out there. Um, Guilty does does offer a, a deduction for certain U.S. shareholders. Haya, would you, would you fill us in on that a little? Yep. So if the U.S. shareholder is a C corporation, a U.S. C corporation, which is, is basically our U.S. corporation, a, 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 um, a non-transparent entity in the U.S. versus the S corporation. I know sometimes people from outside of the U.S. get confused when we say a C corporation because they're not familiar with the S corporation concept. But our standard corporations are allowed a 50 percent dividend receive deduction on their guilty inclusion. So that would give them a, an effective tax rate of 10.5% on their guilty inclusion, right? Because our corporate rate is now 21%. So without a 50% deduction, our effective tax rate would be 10.5% on our, our guilty inclusion. Uh, unfortunately, individuals and any investors in flow-through structures that are that's triggering or generating guilty income do not get that same dividend received deduction and for now at least that income will be treated as ordinary income absence of any further guidance and i say actually in the absence of any further guidance because uh, the irs asked uh, in the proposed regs they were asking for comments on the treatment of guilty whether it should be considered a dividend or ordinary income which i found interesting so we'll see how that develops but i i, I suspect um, this will stay as ordinary income. That's the treatment because, for all intents and purposes, all the guidance and the legislative commentary, it seems that this guilty is supposed to be treated like subpart F income, and subpart F income, as we all know, is ordinary income. Right, right, and that, and that's a good point uh, that the IRS is is, is certainly asking for for comments and or guidance and making some consideration i know i know it's not the it's not potentially the end of the world for if you are a, a, a u.s individual ultimately who's getting hit by guilty and this is something we'll talk about here in a few minutes um uh, later on in the presentation but the but but there is an option to um as a u.s individual treat yourself as a u.s corporation for purposes of guilty and uh, and I don't think it's explicitly clear, but I think it's alluded to um, that this deduction should be this this guilty 50% deduction should be applicable to individuals who make that 962 election. Is that your understanding as well? I I, I think initially it would not be allowed, but I think I think there's some discussion of how how to expand that deduction to apply to individuals who make that election. I have not seen um, anything particular coming out of Treasury IRS on that. I know we're oh, still right. waiting. Yeah, I know we're still waiting for some regs on the foreign tax credit. I don't know if there'll be separate regulations on the 245A. That's the deduction that we're dealing with. Not two. I'm sorry, it's Section 250 deduction. 
Um, but, you know, if you look at, like, again, the legislative history of Section 962, the intent there was to treat uh, a U.S. individual shareholder as a C-Corp. So that would imply that, you know, if an individual is making that 962 election, they should also get the 250 deduction. But, you know, that 50 percent deduction. But I haven't seen anything specific that speaks to that. You know, right. And we'll, we'll talk about that 962 election here in a minute. I just wanted to I just wanted to sort of make note that it's this is that, that what you're reading is certainly not absolute in all in all terms. Um, <laughs> it's certainly what, the best with what we're working with at the moment. <laughs> oh, and, and the funny thought on that, I mean, I had a client that asked us last week. So obviously we're doing restructuring in light of the tax reform. And, you know, we, with the when the regs came out, we had to make some adjustments to the to the plan that we're discussing. And um, the client basically said, well, okay, so nothing else is going to change from here, right? This is it. We're good to go. And I said, well, to put things into perspective, you know, we still haven't gotten final 965 regs. So we're talking about uh, a provision that impacted 2017. Where in November of 2018, so that means everyone pretty much or, you know, most, the overwhelming majority of taxpayers have filed their return that includes that 965 inclusion, and we still haven't gotten final regs. So um, no, nothing is set in stone at this point. I, I know actually there was a technical corrections bill that came out late last night. So who knows what's in there? I haven't had a chance to read through that yet. So uh, everything is up in the air right now. <laughs> All right. Well, you alluded to um, how you alluded a little bit to how foreign tax credits are going to work and how the reg package on foreign tax credits is still supposed to come out. There is there is a little bit of discussion on how foreign tax credits will work relative uh, relative to guilty here. Um, question being, can you get if you are subject to guilty, you're a U.S. shareholder and you have guilty income, can you use uh, foreign tax credits similar to how you would use foreign tax credits? Uh, for subpart F income, um, and that that answer sort of sort of depends at, at the current state of, of the law, as far as we can tell. Um, certainly, if you're a USC corporation, U.S. shareholder, then um, yeah, you should be able to get um, and use foreign tax credit. It's a it's a reduced foreign tax credit. 80% of the deemed paid taxes are available for credit to you. There is no excess credit carry forward on those. Um, uh, effectively, how that works is a USC Corp shareholder shouldn't pay any really additional tax uh, on guilty tax outside what they've paid in at, at the CFC level to the extent that the income is already taxed at 13 and, and an 8 percent in that foreign jurisdiction. Um, the, it, it's kind of a nuanced point in that in that you're relying on all of your income, uh, your guilty income being allocated towards uh, the guilty basket, which under foreign tax credits, they've created a couple new new baskets through this um, through the through the tax reform rules. Um, interestingly, you only get 80% of the deem uh, the deem paid tax available credit, but you are required to include the full amount of foreign taxes for for your Section 78 gross up when you include that in your uh, U.S. income and your foreign tax credit calculation. Broadly speaking, uh, if you're not a U.S.C. corporation, then Generally, uh, no foreign tax credit is available to you absent that 962 election that we're talking about, and how that, that may or may not work out um, with respect to foreign tax credits. We we think if you make that election, the 962, that's where an individual treats himself as a U.S. corporate corporation and subjects itself to U.S. corporate rates on on this guilty income. Um, foreign tax credit should be available. The mechanism that the foreign tax credit is coming through is, I believe, I believe it's a nine section 960 similar to what you would use for um, uh, subpart F income. Any other comments on foreign tax credits out there? Uh, yeah, Chris, I just want to jump in regarding this foreign tax credit. And for this guilty purpose, foreign tax credit is played a very important role. And, and also, they're, they created a separate basket for guilty inclusion. So if the one thing to be mindful is, if there is foreign tax credit, is treated regarding the guilty income. This foreign tax credit is use it or lose it, because all the three other baskets of foreign tax credit we can either carry back one year or carry forward ten years. 
but just for this guilty income, if you do not have sufficient income, if you have excess tax credit, you may lose this credit. So, but we are still waiting for some guidance on the detail how this four basket of foreign credit work out, how to allocate income into different baskets. The trader said they're gonna issue the uh, guidance very shortly before the holiday. So we are waiting for that. Right, and Chai, you, you made the point that uh, additional work is going to be coming around with, with foreign tax credits. Uh, I know certainly in my practice, in the years I've been practicing, uh, the concept of, of deferral has really played uh, the, the major role as far as international tax planning. And as you're deferring that income from being taxed in the U.S., you weren't really uh, needing to use any uh, direct or indirect foreign tax credits. And, and so foreign tax credit computations sort of fell by the wayside to some degree. Um, I suspect annually we'll be looking at foreign tax credit calculations here, certainly for C Corp uh, um, shareholders at a bare minimum. Um, and, and as we all know, foreign tax credit's not, it's probably not the fastest thing to compute on, on a corporate level, especially with uh, deemed, deemed dividends or deemed inclusions, such as what guilty will be. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely going to be a lot more work around foreign tax credits going forward. Um, and I think, like you had said, I think the, the foreign tax credit regs package is expected imminently and it's, it's gonna be a big one. So, you know, in our profession right now, we're being bombarded with uh, regulations that are coming one right after another, which is, it's unprecedented. I mean, I don't think, I don't think that our, our the industry has experienced so much change that was so significant in such a short amount of time. So um, it, it's going to be a fun ride. <laughs> I'm sure we'll all get it. It'll all be done correctly by taxpayers the first time. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And and as it, and as you're starting to see, uh, as the audience probably starting to see, there's some there's definitely some nuance out there in how things are going to be handled. So so. You know, continuing a theme that clarity is not is not is not the sharpest here with these with these rules. Um, uh, there's some nuance in, in how things will be done, so we'll just have to we'll just have to see how things start start working out. Yen, um, mm -hmm. we should be looking at some planning ideas out here. What what what's kind of initially developed in in the planning realm as far as how to how to mitigate some of the impacts of guilty? Sure. So. There are quite a few options right now and we can think about. So we just want to bring those options on the table. So if this option may not all applicable to you, and one of the options we, as we just briefly discussed, if you are US individual shareholder, as you know, the guilty tax is higher than the corporate shareholder. So there's one election available, it's called Section 962 election. This election actually exists in the code since 1960s, and it hasn't been widely used until, current, until recently because it's uh, guilty. So what it does is, for, for this election, the US individual shareholder, for example, have $100 guilty, and the guilty is subject to 37% raise, the individual subject uh, tax liability will be $37. But if this individual make that election, he got three benefits, or at least two benefits here, it's clear. So one is the tax rate on this $100 guilty income will be 21%. So the tax rate, the tax liability reduced from 37 to 21. On top of that, this individual also will be entitled of foreign tax credit. And if this see uh, in the local country have very high tax, and then this individual who make this nice 62 election may have enough sufficient foreign tax credit to cover this guilty tax liability. And also, as we mentioned, we are not clear uh, section 250, which is a 50% deduction for guilty, whether this is at applicable to U.S. individual making this 962 nice election. So we are still waiting for guidance. Hopefully the treasurer can give us guidance whether this is good or not. 
So if you are in the situation, you don't want to take the risk, you don't want to have this uncertainty whether the 50% deduction will be available to you by making this election. Another option is to convert this, uh, if you have individual directly own a foreign CFC, you can convert the structure to a C corp structure, which is insert a US C corp between US individual and the foreign controlled foreign corporations. So by that way, the US shareholder for CFC will change to a US C corp. And then the income, the duty inclusion will be included by the C corp rather than individual. So the benefit of that will be you have lower tax rate, 21%. You have for sure the 50% of section 250 deduction. And also you will have the foreign tax credit and is referred to section 960 D3 foreign tax credit. And there's another nuance just come out from the guilty reg is for the purpose of calculating guilty and particularly about the 10% deemed return. If you have multiple CFC, the CFC with loss uh, with the, the CFC doesn't have the tested income. And then this CFC should not have Q by. As Kaya just mentioned, to calculate guilty, we have tested income, subtract the 10% of the deemed return on the Q by. So if that CFC is the lost CFC, even it has a lot of depreciable asset for guilty purpose, we cannot use this asset to calculate 10% return. So one planning point is if anything we can do to make that loss CFC become profitable, so we can use the 10% return on that CFC's depreciable asset. It can potentially reduce our guilty amount. And the next point I want to bring up is at this moment, in particular on the year end, if you, uh, you have a client that's they have a huge foreign entity group. Maybe you can think about doing some restructuring. Uh, one thing, we easy, can we just give you an easy example. So we all know that CFC is subject to this guilty. One way to get, a way, get around with it is just make that CFC disappear. So for example, we check the box election on that CFC to make it our either a fiscal transparent company or just a disregarded entity. So in that way, you don't have a CFC and then you don't have something to worry about on this duty. But all those options, you need to play around with it, maybe do a tax modeling. Because if you, for example, you check the box on a subsidiary, you may be subject to other tax on the check the box election. So those are options for you to think about it and particularly for the year end tax planning. Chris? Thanks, Ian. Continuing that theme, Ian, uh, I know there's there's obviously questions abound with guilty. Maybe you can talk about some considerations for any uh, cross-border M&A activity. Sure. So now let's say we pass on the year-end projection. We are good with current structure. Now we are going to acquire other entities from foreign uh, jurisdictions. So one thing to you're in mind that if possible, your new structure or new the ownership of new foreign group, if your ownership, foreign ownership is more than 50%, and we should think about to stay away from the CFC structure. So for example, uh, a lot of US private equity firm, they will set up a US partnership and invest in multiple CFCs. So if on this private equity fund, there are a lot of foreign investors. It's possible because sometimes we have layer of partnership. So the effective ownership rate of the, of the lower foreign corporation is lower than the 50%. Maybe we can do, for example, to make this US partnership as a foreign partnership, then the effective ownership of the lower foreign corporation the U.S. shareholder percentage would be lower than 
So that is one way to stay away from CFC. And another way maybe sometimes we see in real practice, we have investor on top who form partnership and then their, their partnership invests in another layer of partnership because the lower partnership also gives some interest in other foreign investors or employees or the previous foreign owners. So we should really think through this structure to find a way, if possible, to stay away from CFC structure. So this is the first thing we need to think about when we're doing foreign acquisition. And second thing we want to point out is uh, take advantage of the foreign tax credit. So now, since we are still waiting for the guidance, but one thing to be in mind is uh, we want to reemphasize that guilty income, the foreign tax credit for guilty is use it or lose it. So if, for example, you have a CFC in Mexico, which has, let's say, 30% tax rate, that so the significant tax rate may be uh, maybe give you a situation at excess foreign tax credit. So you may think about how to change this income from Mexico become a foreign branch. For example, check the box on this CFC and then all the income earned by this Mexican entity will become branch profit, branch income. So the foreign tax credit will change the character, which is from the branch wrap basket, and then it can be carried back and carried forward. So uh, again, this kind of transaction just give you some idea and you should really sort, sort through and work through the impact on this. And uh, also be mindful that the timing of duty inclusion is on the last day of the CFC year. So if a US person buy a CFC from another US person. So the US buyer should be aware that if that CFC is very profitable, for example, if we buy it on November 30th, the seller should be liable or the buyer should do some agreement with the buyer, with the seller, that the first 11 months of duty inclusion should be considered on the purchase price because if nothing, if we do nothing, the buyer will be liable for the full year of CFC's duty inclusion. And uh, the last one, but not the least, is Section 338 election. And this election is, uh, there are some limitations of using this election. It's particular on the cross-border acquisition. So if a buyer bought a foreign CFC at pay a premium. The buyer, if some requirement met, the buyer can make this 338 election, which is to step up the inside basis of the CFC's asset. The benefit of that is we have higher basis for depreciation purpose, amortization purpose, so we, it potentially can reduce our GUP inclusion amount. So those are some basic ideas just for you to consider when you do this cross-border uh, merger acquisition. Thanks, Yan. Um, you know, I wanted to just uh, make it make a quick uh, quick announcement to the audience in general. If you have any questions, there's a there's a messaging chat box on your GoTo webinar meeting. Feel free to enter a question there if you have it. Or, you know, we're going to try and save a just it looks like a minute or two for questions towards the end here. So if you want to raise your hand. We can try and start taking questions as we're running really uh, pretty tight on time to cover the last couple slides here. Maybe we can just give a, a very quick shout out to, to the change in law and how this how this impact of downward attribution might might occur. I think this one's still a little unclear, but it's something you alluded to earlier, Hai and um, Yan. I think this is something you wanted to discuss just briefly. Uh, sure. So as Kaya just mentioned, there is a new rule and it's not new rule it's just the repeal of one paragraph of the code which is under 958 b4 so the result is um, if you can look at these slides just look at Holdco Cayman Island this is a foreign corporation it owns four 
opco for subsidiaries. And in the past, the hold code's ownership in those subsidiaries should not attribute to any other subsidiaries. So after this repeal of section 958B4, the hold code's ownership, for example, in Opco China will be downward attributed to the ownership of Opco US. So as a result, the structure will be Opco Cayman Islands owns Opco US and Opco US owns 100% of Opco China. Therefore, Opco China will be treated as a CFC. So because it is CFC now, all the duty and the sub F income EC will come up. This is a, this may be a very surprise issue when you have a foreign holding company and doing some inbound investment to the U.S. So this one we definitely want all these to be aware of this, just to avoid any surprise on on this issue. Thanks, thanks, Yan. And, and I know we called this the guilty and, and fitty, fitty presentation, so we're going to give the last five minutes to Chaya to, to help us get through the concept of fitty. So, so we presented what is arguably the bad news, and now we'll give some of the good news of tax reform. I'm not leaving a lot of time for the good news, but the good news about the good news is that it's, it's pretty simple and straightforward. So the foreign-derived intangible income provision is essentially the reverse of guilty, and it's an incentive for U.S. taxpayers to keep income, to keep assets and income in the U.S. And what what it is is it's for U.S. C corps. So there's only available for U.S. C corporations that have any type of export sales or have any type of they provide services to customers outside of the U.S. Look, the beneficial tax rate of 13.125% on some of your income. And I say some because, again, similar to guilty, we're not um, directly identifying buckets of income. Rather, there's a formulaic approach, which, again, is similar to guilty in that we look at our deemed tangible investment return in our U.S. C Corp, and that's going to be... 10% of our QBI, so these these terminologies that we that we got out of guilty are also going to be used in FITI. So look at our C corps full taxable income. We determine how much of that is uh, their deemed tangible investment return, which is their 10% of their fixed assets used in trader business, or what we refer to as their QBI, 10% of the QBI. And then everything in addition, everything over and on top of 10% of the QBI or our deemed tangible investment return is our deemed intangible income. And to the extent that that income is foreign derived, which again is also going to be a percentage formula approach, um, that income would be subject to a beneficial rate of 13.125% as opposed to 21%. Um, this what I what I like about this is that there's no structuring or anything required. It's just a calculation. You fill out the form. We have new forms eight nine nine two and eight nine nine three to calculate our guilty and our fitty. Uh, and so you know I wouldn't have people put assets in the U.S. But for companies that are based out of the U.S. This is a really nice benefit for them to take care of that is easily to, easy to take advantage of. Um, and with that, I guess we can turn it. I'll turn it over back to Chris to see if there's any questions that we want to try to take. Great. I, thank you, Chris. And I, I haven't seen any questions come in. Um, so with two minutes remaining, I would like to thank Chris and Jan and Kaya for enlightening us on guilty and fitty. Chris, thanks for stepping in when uh, I had technical difficulties. <laughs> this is uh, the first welcome to the inaugural HOB webinar on international issues. Our next webinar will be on December 18th at the same time, 10 a.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. in the UK, 3 p.m. in Central Europe, and 7 a.m. on the West Coast of the U.S. So I apologize for that. And we will be covering 
Wayfair, which deals with U.S. sales taxes and some major, major changes in the way states are requiring companies selling into their state to collect and remit sales tax. So without any further questions, just one big final thank you, and I look forward to speaking with all of you next week. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.